man, this is one of those days. I just feel like this is one of those days that uh, that God's going to do something good. Amen. You know, sometimes you just you, you just feel it. Amen. You just feel it. You can just feel it. This is one of those days I feel like God is going to do something extraordinary. Amen. I just feel it. I 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 feel like this is going to be one of those days. Amen. You don't have to know how. You don't have to know when. Right? You just have to receive it. You just have to receive it. All right. All right. We're going to continue in our series uh, entitled, Where is the Sacrifice? Where is the Sacrifice? Where is the sacrifice. Where is the sacrifice? It would occur to me that sometimes in what seems to be our never ending pursuit to get. If you think about the thing that drives us most in life, it's it's this desire to get, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. obtain. Yes. Come on, Bishop. Right? We're always in the front of our mind, in the back of our mind, we're talking about, we're thinking about, we're strategizing on how to get. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think, you know, in that we forget the importance of what it means to give. Oh, yeah. Amen now. I think we forget the concept of it being more of a blessing to give than it is to receive. Because I think if we were more mindful of that, we would be strategizing more on how to give. Yes, yes. We'd be looking for more opportunities to give, right, Amen. than we are to get. Mm -hmm. And I want to make this statement. Might be true, might not be true. Might be true in some cases, might not be true in some cases. But I think sometimes in our spiritual immaturity, mm -hmm. we tend to focus on ourselves way too much. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What we think, how we feel, mm -hmm. what we want. And before you know it, our whole life is consumed with us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Come on, Bishop. Mm -hmm. If we're good, it's because something good happened to us. Mm -hmm. If we're not good, it's because something didn't happen good to us. Mm -hmm. If we're upset, it's because something happened to us. Right. And rarely do we find ourselves mm. on a high or low as a result of life happening to somebody else. Oh, wow. Where's the last time you genuinely just felt good because good was happening to somebody else? Wow. Wow. I mean, did it make you feel good? Where's the last time you were able to sleep at night because somebody else was having a good sleep wow. at night? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when was the last time you were brought down because of what somebody else said? What somebody else did. Mm -hmm. What somebody else thought. And it's interesting to me that even as believers, we're so motivated either on what we can get rather than what we can give. All right. We're more motivated by what we feel than what somebody else feels. We spend more time thinking about ourselves than we do thinking about anybody else. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about believers. Yes, yes. Spend more time praying to God for us than we do praying to God for anybody else. Come on, Bishop. And God can bless us, and we'll still be praying for him to bless somebody else when we were the ones designed to be the blessing. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. But we miss the moment because we're so self Centered. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to take that look in the mirror, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
We want to say it's always somebody else's fault. It's always somebody else's doing. It's always the way somebody else feels. It's the way somebody else thinks. No, sometimes it's us. So the concept of loving a God who you can't see. I think it was Apostle John who said, how can you, so you know I'm not talking to non-believers, how can you love a God who you can't see if you can't love your brothers who you can see? Mm-hmm. How can you want a, 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 a blameless God to not judge you when you're constantly judging someone else? That's good, baby. How can you expect to be forgiven when you rarely forgive? Mm-hmm. And sometimes this centeredness around ourself prevents us from being or making a sacrifice for somebody else. Because we've been talking the last couple weeks about the importance of sacrificing to God, but it's equally as important to sacrifice for people. Mm-hmm. Amen. Danny Goki had, had a song said, they said, it all comes down to this, love God and love people. Amen. At the end of the day, that's what it all comes down to. That's it, that's all. Because you can't love God if you can't love people. That's right, that's right. Because all people are God's people. That's right, amen. So if I'm God's child and you're God's child and you got a problem with me, then you also have a problem with our Father. That's right. Yeah. Amen. That's right. And the problem is not always somebody else's. Come on. Put your big boy and big girl pants on. Sometimes the problem is you. All right now. Because we're missing an opportunity to sacrifice for the sake of somebody else. Mm-hmm. Right? We're missing opportunities to sacrifice for the sake of somebody else. I'm going to show you, we're going to look at, most of you already know the story, I just want to frame it in this context. Right? Who, you know, MLK said this. I'll never forget this. He said a lot of things that most of us you know, if we're lucky, we would never forget. But one thing he said that stuck out to me, he said, if a man hasn't found something he's willing to die for, he isn't fit to live. Oh my God. I want you to just let that soak in for a second. He said, if a man hasn't found something he's willing to die for, he isn't fit to live. In other words, if a man hasn't found something that means more to him than himself, then he's missed the point of this life. That's right, amen. We're living this life as a result of somebody who says, I love you more than anything, and I'm willing to give up everything to show you. So how can we then partake of this life and never run across anybody, never meet, never engage, entertain, and involve in a relationship with anybody who we love more than ourselves? And I'm not talking about your children. Come on now. Amen. Amen. That don't count. Amen. The Bible says even demons do that. Yeah. That's what the Bible says. When I die for my kids, you should. You brought them here. Amen. Nobody. Nah, nah, that was about to be graphic. Let me pass on that. I'll just say you brought them here and you can figure out the rest of it. <laughs> There's nobody else on this earth. That you love that much. All right, let's go to let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 20. First Samuel chapter 20. You can go to verse 1. I'm just, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna give a synopsis and then I'm gonna highlight about four scriptures. We can just start at verse one. I'm not gonna read it all. I'm gonna tell you the story first. I'm gonna give you a synopsis. So so uh, Saul is king currently, and the prophet Samuel had prophesied to Saul 
that he would not be king much longer because God was displeased with him. And God had chosen another person, a man after his own heart, to be king. Now, now, Saul did not accept this. He didn't accept this. He wanted to continue to be king, and moreover, he wanted his son in the tradition of the land to be his successor. All right. That's how it was, right? Right? That's how it was. The king was a king, and then his son would be king after him. And so Saul didn't accept the fact that God had rejected him. He didn't accept the fact that his kingdom would end. And he wanted to continue to be king, and he wanted his son to follow in his footsteps. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Amen. But God had a plan for another guy. God had decided David would be king. God had decided David would be king. And so this animosity between Saul and David, and you know, it starts, you know, not just because of prophecy, but ultimately it's fueled because of the prophecy. Right? It, it, you know, jealousy starts, hatred is born, is, is a hatred is a is a is a manifestation of jealousy. You gotta be jealous of you you rarely hate somebody without at some point being jealous of them first. Right? Hatred is a byproduct uh, or, or, an, an, or, or, or a more mature manifestation of jealousy. And so we know that Saul was jealous of David. Uh, David had gained favor with the people. David was more successful in battle. And so Saul, but, but, but more importantly, though, the undertone is Saul saw David as a threat to the throne. And even in, 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 in uh, chapter 23, Jonathan said to David, you're going to be king. I'm going to be right beside you. Even my father knows it. Right? And so sometimes you find yourself under attack. You can't figure out why. And it's spiritual. And you fight it naturally. And you continue to lose or don't feel like you're gaining any ground. Because you're fighting people when you should be fighting spirits. But in our spiritual immaturity, we're so focused on what somebody did to us. Come on, Bishop. We stay so focused and centered on us. Mm -hmm. Well, this makes me feel a certain way. I've been saying for years, and I probably keep saying, the older I get, the more I say it. Who cares what you think? Mm -hmm. If we care less about what we think, we'll be more focused. And demons are manipulating people and attacking us, and we're not always seeing the victory because we're fighting the people instead of addressing the spirit. We say it in church and it sounds good and we'll make a bumper sticker and we'll hashtag it for a while and then you go right back to being mad at a person and stop forgetting about the spirit. That's right. That's good, Bishop. And you'll walk right past another believer and not speak to them and lift your hands up to Jesus in worship. Now, listen, this is not a, it's not a, I'm, I'm coming down on anybody's message. I'm, I'm trying to get to another place, but I got to lay the foundation first. Yes. Because if we don't learn how to live this life, we're going to forfeit our reward. Mm -hmm. So, so Jonathan, David finds favor with Jonathan. The king's son. Now, this is an interesting dynamic because Jonathan, by law, should be king after his father. So if Saul sees David as a threat to the throne, shouldn't Jonathan also see David as a th threat to the throne? Mm -hmm. So why doesn't Jonathan see this threat that his father sees? Is it because his father is wiser? Is it because he's more experienced? Is it because he's older? Is it because he's a king? No. None of the above. It's because Jonathan is being, Jonathan is being led by the Lord. Amen. And Saul is being centered around himself. That's good. See, what, what if your destiny wasn't to be at the top of the pyramid, but to be the one to help somebody to get to the top of the pyramid? What if that was your destiny? Well, 
That ain't God. That can't be. I should be the top of the pyramid. But somebody's got to help somebody get there. And somebody's got to advise them when they get there. And somebody's got to board off all their tax from the enemy when they get there. Somebody's got to be that right hand that ride or die. Somebody's got to be the one they trust, the one they can confide in, the one they can be themselves with. You'd like that, but you wouldn't want to be that. Scotty Pippen still one of the top 50 players of all time. Amen. That's right. I mean, legitimately. That's right. I mean, the top 50 players, he's, he's still one of them. Everybody can't be Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to be. <laughs> Scotty wasn't a bad cat to be. So, so, so David is trying to figure out, and he is heartbroken at why the king is so hell-bent on killing him. What have I done? David doesn't get it. He, 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 David is so sensitive, and he is, so, he is just distraught. Why is Saul? I love Saul. I honor Saul. I respect Saul. All of it was true. But why is he so hell-bent on killing me? Because he sees you as a threat. And rather yield to the will of God, like some people, he's resisting like other people. So let's point out some scripture. Let's point out some verses here. Go to verse 4. So Jonathan says to David, whatever you yourself desire, I will do it for you. This guy is totally submitted to David. Mm -hmm. Totally committed to David. Totally willing to serve David. Whatever it is you yourself desire, I'll do for you. Go to verse 9. So now they're trying to come up with this plan um, to see if, if, if the David is not at the king's dinner, how will he know if the king really plans to do him harm or not? So he and Jonathan are working out a plan, and Jonathan comes up with a signal how he will signal David if he finds out that the king wants to hurt him, and how he'll let him know if the king doesn't want to hurt him, because he says, hey, after all, I'm his son. Whatever he does, he'll tell me. Whatever he wants to do, he'll tell me. And, and, and David says, yeah, but he knows that I have favor with you, so maybe he won't tell you. Jonathan said, trust me, I'll find out, and I'll let you know. All right. God judged between me and you. He made a covenant. He made several covenants with David, but he said, I promise you, I'll tell you. Jonathan said, far be, it from, far be it from you, for if I knew certainly that evil was determined by my father to come upon you, then would I not tell you? So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to something. I'm trying to get to something. I'm almost there. Go to verse 17. Now Jonathan again calls David to vow because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. So Jonathan said, listen, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure nothing happens to you, but I want you to don't forget about me. I want you to make a covenant. Don't forget me. When God raises you to power and God cuts off all your enemies, don't forget me and don't forget my family. And then go to verse 31. Jonathan loved him as he loved himself. Is there anybody in this world you love like that? So here's what Saul says to Jonathan. And this is where it all comes to a boiling point between father and son. Saul becomes livid when he finds out David's not at the dinner. Jonathan comes up with an excuse that he and David had concocted. Tell him my family got sick. You let me go to, to, to be with my family. Uh, and, and Saul went just ballistic. But he breaks it down to Jonathan like this. He says, 
For as long as the son of Jesse lives on earth, he's talking about David, you shall not be established nor your kingdom. As long as David lives, you and your kingdom will not be established. In other words, God has a plan for David. That plan is going to supersede my plan for you. And so as long as David lives, then you're going to not reach the place that you should. Now, therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Now, I didn't want to do this, but I think I will. Go to verse 32. He said, bring him to me. Look, enough of this. Enough of this. As long as this dude is living, he is going to take your place. And I'm not going to stand by and let it happen. So bring him to me. I'm going to kill him. I'm tired of playing around with it. David's going to die. David is not going to be king under my watch. I don't care what God says. I don't care what the prophet says. I'm king, and you'll be king after me. David's going to die. Because now Saul's tired of playing around, right? They're going back and forth and him and and all in. And Saul knows that Jonathan is trying to cover for David. He knows David is using Jonathan, according to him, to, to escape him, and he's tired of playing. Bring David to me. I'm going to kill David. That's the end of it. And Jonathan answered and said to, to Saul, his father, why should he be killed? What has he done? Now, here's the problem. Because nobody questions the king. All right. Now, Jonathan is out of line because now he's forgotten his place. I'm his son, but he's still a king. I said, bring him to me. I'm going to kill him. That's the end of it. And he said, why should you kill him? What has he done to you? This is not right. And the next verse says, then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him. Jonathan. By which Jonathan knew that it was determined by his father to kill David. So Saul is so furious that he takes his spear and tries to kill his own son. He wasn't playing. He threw it at him. Then he goes on to curse him out in biblical language. <laughs> he did, he does. He does. In biblical language, he goes on to curse out his son. But what's more important, he tried to kill him because he is so blinded by his own ambition, he's determined nothing is going to stop him. Which brings me to the point of the message. Jonathan sacrificed his life, his legacy, and his family for David. And typically the only other person we reference in the, in the framework of doing anything remotely Related to Jesus, typically in the Bible, is Stephen. But Jonathan was willing to betray his father, willing to be known as a traitor to the king. Willing to be looked at as one who would turn against his own blood. Sacrifice his legacy. His father has made it clear, in case you don't get it. As long as David is living, you won't be king. He's willing to sacrifice the kingdom. That's his legacy. So what is it about David? about David? Wrong question. Right? Because if we start answering that question, we can find some things that are good, we can find some things that are not so good. We can find reasons to justify why Jonathan probably shouldn't have done it. But that's not the right question. The question becomes, what is it about Jonathan? 
What is it about Jonathan? All right. And this really hit home to me yesterday. I was, wa I, I was watching this uh, series. Uh, it's called The Dark Side of the Ring. I, I, am, I am still a, a wrestling fan. And The Dark Side of the Ring talks about real life stories about wrestlers that you might not know about. And it was, I was watching a story about Chris Benoit. I don't know if many of you know Chris Benoit. He was a wrestler, very popular wrestler, who actually lived in Fayetteville, Georgia. And he made the news because he killed his wife and his son and then hung himself in his Fayetteville home. And no one could understand why this guy, who had many had overlooked because he was simply short, the knock on him was he was too short. But he persevered and, and, he, and he muscled through and he became a huge wrestling uh, success. And he was a loner type guy. And he became friends with another wrestler. They used to compete against each other in Japan. They didn't even like each other. But they had so many matches because they were so compatible in the ring that they worked together quite a while. And they began to, to mutually respect one another. And they began to be friends outside of wrestling. And it was described as the most genuine, beautiful, honest, outside of work friendship that many people had seen. And this guy, so this is a true story. You, you, you can look it up. This guy loved, and his friend was Eddie Guerrero. And Eddie Guerrero was the only friend that Chris Benoit had. And Chris Benoit loved Eddie Guerrero so much, he did everything together. They were inseparable. He was the only person he trusted, the only person he talked to. And, and Chris Benoit wasn't a believer. And Eddie Guerrero, Guerrero was a believer. And Eddie, Eddie Guerrero would preach to Chris Benoit and he gave him a Bible for Christmas. And, and they were like brothers. And so eventually, they were in Minnesota or somewhere for an event, and, and they were going to meet in the morning to go to the gym. Long story short, Eddie Guerrero was found dead uh, in his hotel room, and Chris Benoit was never the same. People said that he was affected more than the man's own wife. They said he took it as if someone had lost a spouse. And he never recovered. He never recovered. He never bounced back. He said he couldn't imagine life without his friend. It's a true story. And he would go to their house, to the upstairs gym, and the kids, his kids would hear him crying. This big, if you know who Crispin was, he's a tank. This big, muscular guy just crying. They said at the funeral, Chris Jericho said he laid his head on him and cried so hard that the tears went through his jacket and through his shirt and he could feel it on his skin. His arm was actually wet from the tears that saturated his suit, his vest, and his shirt. And ultimately, this, this depression that he sunk into was, was the cause of him ultimately uh, killing his wife and his, and his son and himself because there was no reason for him in his mind to live. Mm. And Bishop, why would you bring up such a dark and gloomy story in church? Because I want to just make a point. Now, I'm not suggesting that you love someone so much that you can't live without them. I know people sing about it and we talk about it and that. But what I'm saying to you is is there somebody you love that you would sacrifice everything for who didn't have your last name? Is there somebody you would give of yourself for, give of your resources, give of your time, give of your talent? Is there somebody you would tolerate no matter how many times they fail or no matter how many times they messed up? And we're so quick to draw a line in the sand and say when our help stops, and when I've done enough, and when you should figure it out on your own, and when you should know better by now. And we serve a God who treats us the exact opposite. Amen. 
No matter how many times we fall, he's right there. Amen. There's nothing we can do to make him not love us. And he never loves us any less. And he's always gracious to us. And he's always kind to us. And he always shows us mercy. And I'm just saying at some point in this life, while you're living, you got to learn to love somebody besides yourself. Amen. Amen. That's all I'm saying. Amen. I'm just saying you got to love somebody besides yourself. You can get in your car and drive to somebody's home and change the whole complexity of their day. Why wouldn't you do that? Amen. Why wouldn't you do it? Mm -hmm. Well, because I. There we go. Mm -hmm. That's why. Because I. That's right. <laughs> but when you pray, you want God to stand at attention. Mm -hmm. You want him to stop still. Pay attention to you and respond. Do you not? Amen. I know I do. Yes, sir. Ever since I lied in church, <laughs> when I pray, I want God to hear me speak. Amen. I want him to send and answer. And I be working my faith like never before. Mm -hmm. I don't be talking. I be I'm, I'm in, from in here. I just be on the word, on the word, on the word, because I know God hears the word. I know he has to respond to the word. And I know if he said it, he can't lie. So I just hold him accountable for what he says when I want something from him. Amen. But don't ignore that voice you hear in your head that tells you, hey, do this for this person. Don't, don't brush it off. I'll do it tomorrow. I thought tomorrow wasn't promised. Not right now. What if you don't see tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Do it. Do it. This guy was willing to sacrifice everything. Let me tell you something. There's no greater feeling I don't believe in this world, or one of the greatest feelings in this world, is to see somebody get blessed and then say, you know what, I thank God for using you to help me get there. All right now. Because then you know if you've never done anything right in your life, you did that. Yeah. God used you mm -hmm. to have a kingdom impact on somebody else. And if, if we're not doing that, then what's the point? Mm -hmm. What's the point? We're living to what? Get a car? Mm. It don't make you happy. Amen. I got several of them. That's not the source of my happiness. Hmm. Last Sunday, I thought I was going to die. True story. I didn't know what was happening. I looked at my wife. She looked at me. She, my wife was looking at me like, she was like, you want to go to the, you want to go to the hospital? This is last Sunday. I had a really rough week, man. Physically, I had a rough week. And I felt so bad. My wife started praying. We just, I just, that's. And I got over that by the grace of God, and I got hit with something else, and I was like, God. <laughs> and I was I was miserable most of the week. I don't think I really got any real relief until probably yesterday. I had a really miserable week. So what if I put off? I'll do it tomorrow. If you don't let somebody know you love them today, what was the point of you living? Amen. Amen. What was the point? Amen. You to have a good meal. A nice car don't stop you from being stuck in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. And until they make one that can rise above the traffic, they all the same. They all the same. Bill Cosby, in the height of his of his career, he pulled up at the war show and everybody was waiting for him. These limousines were coming, and it was like, that's not him. And he was like the keynote speaker. And it was like, that's not him. And I'm talking about Bill Cosby at the height of his, his career. Mm -hmm. And it was just like everybody was just waiting, where's Bill Cosby? And every limousine that pulled up, they assumed it was Bill Cosby. And there was a cab that pulled up and nobody paid attention. And Bill Cosby got in a cab and walked past everybody. <laughs> 
And somebody said, hey, he's in there. How'd he get in there? Where did he come from? He said, I came up in a cab. And nobody, everybody was looking at the limousine. Mm -hmm. I walked right past him. And he said, why did you come up in a cab? Where you expect you coming? He said, because I'm Bill Cosby. <laughs> I'm Bill Cosby in a cab, just like I'm Bill Cosby in a limousine. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sacrifice for the sake of somebody else. That's kingdom work. Somebody needs to know you love them. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to know that no matter how many times they mess up, somebody still believes in them. Somebody needs to know no matter how hard it gets, somebody's praying for them, somebody's got their back. And if it don't start with the church, where does it start? Mm -hmm. Where does it start? Mm -hmm. And I get it. I get tired too sometimes. The Bible says you're not become weary, well doing, but the proper time you reap the harvest if you do not give up. We can't give up. We have to be the ones who continually forgive, Amen. continually love, Amen. continually give, Amen. continually support, yeah. continually, continually, continually. Amen. So when people are hurting, they come. That's when right. people are sick, they come. Yeah. And when they can't come, they watch. Yeah. And we impact their lives because we consistently are concerned about the kingdom. Amen. 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 Let's go.